Good morning, welcome back to part three of our series of lessons on Acts 1, scene three. Uh, in today's lesson, which I've titled Desdemona's Defense, we'll be looking at uh, Desdemona's testimony in, uh, before the Duke and the Senators of Venice. Uh, we'll be looking at her defense of her actions in, in terms of her decision making, in terms of her rationale, and in terms of her reasons for marrying Othello and disobeying her, her father, uh, which is of course what she's been accused of. So she, we'll, we'll look at how she defends herself and, and, defends, and the arguments she puts forward and we'll look at how Brabantio responds to that and we'll be looking at uh, essentially the, there's a kind of a shift in the scene uh, towards the looming conflict that as I've said before kind of hangs over the play uh, between the Turks and the Venetians and we'll be looking at how Desdemona manages to convince the Duke that he ought to allow, allow her to travel with Othello uh, to Cyprus uh, to accompany him as his wife and we'll look at the arguments she puts forward for that as well. So it's going to be, I'm trying to cover quite a lot in today's lesson, I'm not going to go through every single line in the scene but I'll be going through some of the key moments um, and breaking them down for you and hope hopefully offering you uh, clear explanations of this scene. Let's get started. Okay, so the scene begins with uh, Brabantio summoning his daughter to testify on his behalf. He, he as remember, we remember that Brabantio is the patriarch uh, and the authority figure. Remember that as a patriarch he would consider himself the god of his own household, that he would consider Desdemona, uh, obviously he would have tender feelings of love towards her as his daughter, but he'd also consider her, in some senses, his property. We just have to bear in mind the context of the play, you know, the fact that uh, in, the, in, the, in the Elizabethan period, the role of the daughter was very much determined by the father until she was given to a new husband. So uh, it, we have to remember this patriarchal world that our characters operate in. So... Brabantio calls forth his daughter and he says here, do you perceive in all this noble company where most you owe obedience? And that's the crux of the issue for Brabantio. He's charging his daughter with being disobedient for uh, breaking social boundaries, for, for transgressing uh, because she has not followed uh, her father's um, wishes. She hasn't followed social convention. She hasn't asked her father uh, to marry Othello and, and in fact Othello has not asked her father for his daughter's hand in marriage. And really what's going on here is that Brabantio is trying to uh, ensure that in front of a public Desdemona um, confirms her loyalty and her obedience to her father uh, and I suppose um, demonstrates that she has understood the severity of the charges and, and that she's aware of who is the true authority in her life. And that's really what's going on here. It's Brabantio you know, demanding to know to whom she owes loyalty, to, to whom she, owes, to whom she uh, perceives authority. And then Desimone's fascinating response is one of... It's, it's a, it reminds me a little bit of Othello's response in an earlier lesson in that it's rather uh, measured, it's quite refined, it's very eloquently put forward here. Uh, and it all hinges on this word here, but... Uh, because she'll give, and it, it, her introductory uh, sentences are rather, uh, they're dutiful, they're respectful, they are um, in some ways deferential, and yet it all hinges on that one conjugation, or, or on that but, because she'll then uh, introduce her argument in the latter half of this short speech. Um, so she addresses her father, my noble father, I do perceive here a divided duty. And that essentially is, is, the, is her thesis. That's her central argument that she's about to make. Um, and it, I suppose it's metaphorical, the divided duty, and, and let's think about who, she, who the duty is divided between. It's on the one hand, Othello. On the, one, on the other hand, Brabantio. So it's interesting that really, she, as a woman in this period, she is essentially forced to identify as being either the property of her husband, Othello, or the property of her father, Brabantio. There's, that, that's the kind of the sort of restrictions that she lives with, within. And I, I suppose it shows how confined and restricted Desdemona is, in a sense. 
And I suppose it, 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 we can make a comment about gender conventions and gender roles at, at the time. So she says, I do perceive her divided duty. She means that she doesn't know whether to follow uh, or, or to show obedience towards her husband or to Brabantia, her father. Uh, both, though, are male authority figures. So, but it really, we, we, this is emphasising the, the patriarchal nature of the Venetian world. She addresses Brabantia first. She says, to you I am bound for life and education. My life and education both to learn me, to learn me uh, do learn me rather, how to respect you. You are the lord of duty. I am hitherto your daughter. So she's flattering, flattering her, her father. Uh, she uses words such as duty, bound, uh, lord of duty, uh, to reiterate this idea that she is a, a child uh, belonging to this patriarch. Uh, I think there's, real, there's a real sense here of her mentioning these power hierarchies and these power structures um, because she's very much pla deliberately placing herself as being uh, the in inferior, uh, the, the lesser of the two. She's showing deference, she's showing, showing her service. Um, I think it's interesting that she deliberately tries to, to remind her father of the role that he's played in her life. Uh, he's been clearly very fundamental to her upbringing. Uh, he's given her life and education. Life and education, she's learnt from him and she's learnt how to respect him. And she ends, you know, you are the lord of duty, I am hitherto your daughter. Uh, and she uses these phrases like lord of duty to make her sound uh, as though he were the master and, and she were the servant. So there's an interesting dynamic here. In, in terms of her language. I think the fact that she emphasises the personal pronoun of your daughter, I'm hitherto your daughter. Uh, so at, at the end of the argument before the big but, she says, I'm up until now your daughter. So here's where we get the division, because she said it initially, you know, it's a divided duty. Up, up until now, my whole life and education I've learned from you, I've learned how to respect you, you're the lord of duty. Up until now, I am your daughter. But, and here it is, here's the big but the, the, the shift, the um, moment in which everything turns upon a dime, as it were. Here's my husband, she, she says, and so much duty as my mother showed to you, preferring you before her father, so much I challenge that I profess due to the more my lord. And what's powerful about um, Desdemona's argument is that she reminds the audience, I suppose, and her father uh, of the gender conventions. Uh, she, she reminds them of the patriarchal nature of Venice and of the traditions of Venice in that once a wife uh, enters into the family of her husband, she becomes his possession, his property, uh, not the property of, the fa of her father. So in a sense, she's actually, I suppose she's rebuking the challenge or the assertion that was made that she is in some ways rebellious. I think, this is, I think this is actually someone saying, I'm not rebellious, I'm not someone who's merely revolted. I'm in fact, if, if anything, I'm actually upholding the social conventions of my society by showing loyalty and obedience, not to my father now, but to my husband. So I think it's a rebuke about the idea of her rebellious nature uh, and of this idea of her being of her revolting or or if you think about the more pernicious charges brought against Othello, perhaps she's rebuking the the assumption that she was somehow forced into this marriage or in some ways manipulated by Othello. So here's my husband, and so much duty as my mother showed you uh, to you, preferring you before her father. So much I challenge that I profess due to the more my lord. And it's, essentially what she's doing here, I think, is she's emphasising the traditional nature of her decision to marry Othello and to now show loyalty towards him. I think she's actually saying, I'm not this, um, I'm not this rebellious, uh, subversive character that you portrayed me as. If, if anything, I'm actually upholding social norms. I think she's saying, I'm upholding and following these norms that you yourself... Uh, undertook and, and underwent. Her, her mother showed to you the same loyalty. So it's interesting that I think, I mean, I, I would argue that she's, she's tr attempting to show the irony here in Brabantio's anger uh, towards Othello and Desdemona for doing essentially what he did. So there's an element of hypocrisy there, I think, that she's uh, 
charging her father with. Um, and she ends her speech, so much I challenge that I professed due to the Lord, uh, the more my Lord. And the word Lord is echoed. We had that word earlier, the Lord of duty in that phrase there. It's echoed here, uh, but this time it's in reference to Othello who becomes her Lord. And again, really what she's saying here is I'm once again, as a woman, I'm playing a role within society that is expected of me. This time my new role is of a wife rather than as a daughter and therefore my lord, my master, becomes my husband. So she's actually speaking in a manner or um, using words and phrases that actually are, belong to custom and belong to social convention. And I think she's reiterating the fact that she she's, she's following these conventions, following these customs, following these norms rather than breaking away from them. Um, that's what I think is the essence of her argument there. Let's look at Brabantio's response. Brabantio um, is furious. It's very similar to if you've ever uh, read A Midsummer's Dream or um, Romeo and Juliet, and you look at the relationship between fathers and daughters, it's similar to the relationship between uh, Aegeus and Hermia in A Midsummer's Dream, and it's similar to the relationship between Lord Capulet and Juliet uh, at points in the, in the play Romeo and Juliet. Uh, Brabantio, furious, says, uh, get on with the state affairs. Uh, that means go back to talking about war. Uh, goodbye, I've done. It's quite comical almost. He, 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 he's done with her. He's, he's uh, doing away with her. It's almost as though he is, in some senses, um, emphasising the fact that he's, he's going to estrange himself from her. He's going to distance himself from her and break off any relationship with her. So he's, he, he's essentially saying, I'm now estranged to my daughter. Um, I'd rather adopt a child than get it. So he, he's, again, in furiously, um, furiously rebuking and furiously insulting his daughter, saying I'd rather adopt a child than get it, uh, kind of dismissing her in a sense. And then he talks and addresses uh, the more. He addresses Othello. Interesting that he still simply refers to Othello as more. I think we, we've still got this kind of racially charged um, use of language here. And he says to Othello, I hear you give thee uh, that with all my heart, which but thou hast already with all my heart I would keep from thee. And it's an interesting play on words here. So it obviously folks centres on the, on the heart. He's giving, there we go, terrible drawing. He's giving uh, Othello his, uh, what with all his heart he would with all his heart keep from him. So he's giving, uh, essentially what he's giving to Othello is something that is... Uh, that's something he something he's, he treasures, but something he would he would for all the world not give to him. So it's a really valuable possession that he would rather he would more than anything not want to see fall into Othello's hands. So clearly he's not showing much grace here. He's not he's he's not um, accepting the that uh, Desdemona's testimony. He's furious with what she's just said, and he says later. For your sake, Jewel, I'm glad at soul I have no other child. So uh, remi it reminds me a little bit of, again, Lord Capulet in Romeo and Juliet. Uh, Ju Desdemona is, again, interestingly referred to as a jewel. So again, she's a, a commodity, a possession, a, a, a good, in a sense, for him. That's something that he uh, owns. Uh, for your sake, Jewel, I'm glad at soul I have no other child. So again, what, what he means by this is that he, she so angered him uh, and and in, in his eyes, she has betrayed him. That he's glad to have no other children who would go on to betray him. Um, he's that's what he means. Here. He says, "If if I had another child, I would only I would learn how to be a tyrant, and I would learn to hang clogs on them. And what he means by that is shackle them uh, to, to, and treat them as slaves. Again, think about the use here of language that uh, links to commodities and to Objectif uh, ob and, and the objectification of women, in a sense, which has ha happened throughout this encounter. So he's saying, essentially, if I were to have a, other children, I would only become a tyrant, I'd only mistrust them, I'd only abuse them uh, because of the betrayal that I've um, experienced from you. So f a furious response from Brabantio. The Duke says, um, let me speak like yourself and lay a sentence. And we have these kind of layers of... That social dynamics. So we have lots of references to power structures again. Uh, if you think about Venice as being a city-state, we now have the ultimate patriarch, uh, the Duke, saying, I'm now going to speak 
uh, like yourself and lay a sentence. So we have another character attempting to assert authority. We had very much linking back to how Brabantio tried to assert his authority over Desdemona earlier. Now we have the patriarch uh, of the city who is going to assert his authority, although remember his authority is also the law. He is the, uh, the leader of Venice. And he essentially offers Brabantio uh, these kind of idioms and proverbs of wisdom. Um, he urges Brabantio to move on. He says, uh, when remedies are past, the griefs are ended by seeing the worst, which later on depended. To mourn a mischief that is past and gone is the next way to draw new mischief on. So essentially, if you, if you continue to mourn uh, your, the mischief of your daughter, you will only create more new mischief in the, in the, in, in the future. You will only create more misfortune. He then says, uh, what cannot be preserved when fortune takes patience her injury a mockery makes? Again, what he may, means here is that when chance robs us of something... Um, the exercise of patience will help us to make light of the situation. So it's important to, to exercise patience and not to be impatient. And then the more kind of obvious final line, uh, the, robbed that start, uh, the robbed that smiles steals something from the thief. He robs himself that spends a bootless grief. So again, the idea that if you are robbed, uh, if you smile uh, to the thief, you, you don't experience the loss that they want you to feel and you don't, you don't mourn over a pointless uh, loss is what he's trying to say here. Um, notice, by the way, this happens a lot in Shakespearean uh, tragedies, but especially and in comedies as well, uh, where characters of authority revert to speaking in uh, verse and in rhyming couplets. Um, and I think this is an example of. I mean, it, it, usually characters who speak in rhyming couplets and, and in verse are authority figures. So again, it's perhaps not a coincidence that the Duke, when laying out a sentence, and what he means by that is a judgment, he, he reverts back to verse to give his uh, sentence more weight, I suppose. Interestingly, Brabantio responds in verse, and I think I read this as being a, a challenge to authority. I don't. Th I think what what uh, how Brabantio deals with the sentence of the Duke is actually uh, rather petulant. I think he's uh, verging on being disrespectful. I think he is being disrespectful. I think he's being petulant. I think he's being. Uh, I think he presents as being incredibly embittered. Uh, he does not seem to. T he does not take this uh, sentence very well, uh, and he throws back in the face of the Duke. He challenges and rebukes what the Duke just said. He throws those lines back at him. Uh, he was just given the advice uh, to smile uh, when someone steals... Sorry, to smile at a thief who steals something from him. That was the advice he's just been given. And Brabantio tosses those words, words, hurls them back, hurls the words back at him and says, So let the Turk of Cyprus us beguile. We lose it not so long as we can smile. And he brings up... You know, the Duke was speaking about Desdemona and his, you know, and the fact that the Duke has been robbed of his daughter. Brabantio hurls those words, words back at the Duke in a petulant manner and says, "Well, why don't you do the same thing with with Cyprus? Which you know, Cyprus is the Venetian military fortress, uh, the fortified island that is under threat from the Turkish forces. So why don't you smile uh, when you're robbed of Turkey?" So he throws back the matters of state that he asked them to go on discussing. So really quite a petulant response from Brabantio. We then have, just bear with me, um, essentially Brabantio continues his uh, diatribe. He is wounded, he, he is heartbroken, he's bruised. I'm not gonna go into a great deal of detail on this bit because I want to focus on Othello's response. And the Duke then goes from, I mean, and I remember the Brabantio speaking in verse, Brabantio then ends his, ends his speech by saying, uh, I humbly beseech you proceed to the affairs of state to so go back to speaking about uh, the, on, the, the oncoming crisis between Turkey and Venice. The Duke goes back to prose and he summons Othello who is the fortitude of the place uh, is who is best known, so he's the person who knows Cyprus the best, uh, who is going to be the most useful general, and he uh, essentially urges Othello to lead uh, 
a fleet to, to Cyprus um, almost immediately. In fact, I think it is the, that very night they have to depart. Uh, Othello, bear with me, Othello responds, the tyrant custom most grave senators hath made the flinty and steel couch of war my thrice driven bed of down. Um, so this is an extended metaphor. Uh, and I think it's important to figure out and um, just explain what he means by the tyrant custom because then the rest of it makes sense. The tyrant custom is the military life uh, that he's led. That's the tyrant custom. Custom is a habit, the tyrannical aspect of it refers to the difficult nature of the military life. So the tyrant custom, most grave senators, hath made the flinty and steel couch of war uh, my thrice driven bed of down. And what he means by this is that he's so used to the military life, he's so used to these conflicts that uh, the uh, flinty and steel driven, uh, steel couch, and obviously these are words that connote weaponry, uh, of war has become a bed of down. So there's a juxtaposition between the uncomfortable nature of this uh, steel and flinty bed, which is obviously the bed of war, um, and refers to armour and sleeping in, in, the, in the tented field, as he put it earlier on, and the comparison between that and the bed of down, down being the softest of beds. So he's, he's essentially saying, I'm used to the hard military life, I'm used to uh, the, the uh, wars, uh, I'm used to going off to battle. Um, and he simply, I'm, I'm not going to go through every single moment here, he simply asks that uh, his wife receive suitable um, accommodation, and when the Duke responds, why can't she stay at her father's, he says, I'd rather she didn't, uh, uh, as does Brabantio. And Desdemona then interjects, and quite boldly, uh, given that I just said that she was, she's been playing the role of this traditional submissive um, wife figure, uh, and she's tried to emphasise the fact that she's someone who follows social conventions rather than breaking them, uh, Desdemona rather boldly and rather... I would argue rebelliously, uh, urges the Duke uh, to lend his prosperous ear and find a charter in her voice, which means find uh, a plea in her voice, find a uh, pardon. The Duke says, what would you want? And here we have De Desdemona's defence of, or rather her rationale for going with Othello to Cyprus, which is rather unusual, rather bold, some would argue rather courageous, I suppose, and also sh surely shows uh, devotion to her husband. But there's more going on, there are more subtleties, more nuances than that uh, as we read through. So I'll read out the speech up until let me go with him and then we'll go over it in more detail. That I did love the more to live with him, my downright violence and scorn of fortunes made trumpet to the world. My heart subdued even to the very quality of my lord. I saw Othello's visage in, my, in his mind, and to his honours and his valiant parts did I my soul and fortunes consecrate. So that, dear lords, if I be left behind a moth of peace and he go to war, the rights for why I love him are bereft me, and I a heavy interim shall support by his dear absence. Let me go with, me, let me go with him. So it's a very passionate plea. And like I said, it's more nuanced than it first appears. Um, once again, she uses, uh, I would say, she tries to argue that she is a traditional, um, conventional wife, initially. So she claims to love them more, uh, to live with him. And that's the initial part of her argument. I, I fell in love with him and I wanted to live with him. I wanted to accompany him. I wanted to be his... Um, I wanted to follow him in, through life. So she wants to be his uh, companion. It's no good that she's just loved, she loves him without living with him. Um, some might, you might read this as being slightly more suggestive, you might read this as being um, about her possibly raising the point that she, they have yet to consummate their marriage and she wants to, um, she, she's referring to the kind of conjugal rights of a wife who's just married her husband, that there is perhaps that suggestion as well. My downright violence and scorn of fortunes made trumpet to the world. And that's what she, but by trumpet to the world she means she intends to air her grievances. Um, so, my downright violence and scorn of fortune. What she might mean by this is that she has, I think she's speaking metaphorically about her feelings. 
Uh, it's her violent feelings, her tempestuous and passionate feelings towards her husband, perhaps. Her scorn of fortune, uh, it seems odd, seeing as she's not really suffered any misfortune as yet, but she means, perhaps, that she has a disdain for the consequences. So she's almost asking for forgiveness from the Duke, because she knows what she's about to say, perhaps, um, is rather transgressive, rather um, subversive. She claims that her heart is subdued even to the very quality of my lord. Um, and here again she reverts back to the role of a kind of conventional, traditional wife in that she's emphasising that she is obedient to her husband. And it's interesting again that she chooses rather than to refer to Othello as Othello or uh, as her husband, she refers to him in a kind of master-servant type way. She, a, a, again, a, a, a way in which... Uh, demonstrates her, or uh, rather his authority over her. He is the lord, she is the, the mistress, she's not as powerful, she's not on the same, uh, she's not from the, not the same level of power. My heart subdued even to the very quality of his of the lord. Uh, so her heart is obedient to the character of Othello, and um, again perhaps there's a suggestive sexualized element here as well. Um, she says, I saw Othello's visage in his mind. Uh, so again, probably playing on the idea that she fell in love with his personality, she fell in love with his, uh, the beauty of his mind rather than his outward countenance. So perhaps here she's countering this idea that was put forward by Brabantia that she fell in love with something she ought to have feared, that's what Brabantia said earlier, and she's saying, well actually I fell in love with the character, the nobility, the, um, positive, per the pos positive traits of Othello, not with uh, his outward show. So it's the first kind of reference to her falling in love with a black man in a sense, and it's rather subtle. It's rather subtle. Um, so implying that uh, the blackness of Othello's face, his visage, is a facade that masks his true nature. Uh, which is interesting because we talk a lot about black and white imagery and blackness and whiteness throughout the play. And um, we heard from Othello about why Desdemona fell in love with him as for his the storytelling, the, the, the stories he would tell her. And now this is really her first reference to his, to his race and what she's seemingly saying is that falling in love with a black man was not a monstrous and unnatural act. I fell in love with his mind. I fell in love with, his, with the beauty of his mind. But there is again the implication, therefore, that his visage is ugly and, and, some, and somehow his visage is uh, merely... Um, his visage doesn't, I suppose his blackness doesn't convey his inner beauty. And I think that's rather problematic, isn't it? The fact that his, his blackness is still, you know, ugly by these standards of beauty in the Elizabethan period. She fell in love with his honours, his valiant parts, and did I my soul and fortunes consecrate. It's interesting that she uses the language of a religious rites here. Uh, and what she means here, really, is that she's given up her former life for her new husband. She's dedicating herself to him. She's devoting herself to him. And she then says, to kind of emphasize the point she's trying to make, my dear lords, if I were left behind a moth of peace and he go to war, the rights for why I love him are bereft of me. So again, we link back to this idea of religious rights and, and consecration and possibly the, the sexually suggestive idea that she is talking about. The act of consummation which has been denied her. That might be what she means when she says here, she says, the rights for why I love him are bereft me. So, again, it's a play on words because the rights obviously uh, refer to the kind of a, a religious ritual and, and again emphasize her argument that she's a devoted wife who kind of worships the ground that her husband walks upon, but also rights as in human rights, as in the right to be uh, her husband's companion. Uh, she is arguing in a sense that she's um, been denied the privileges of being a wife. She's been denied the uh, these qualities that a wife possesses. And she said, and she, it's interesting that she claims that she's now bereft. She's been robbed of those rights. Interestingly, going back to that previous statement, so her argument really here is that. I've fallen in love with Othello, not with his face, but with his mind, and I fell in love with his honours and his valiant parts. So I've fallen in love with the warrior-like part of Othello. So therefore, I ought to go with him uh, 
to war rather than remain here a moth of peace. And it's a lovely little metaphor uh, to describe her, I suppose, as being vulnerable, fragile, uh, rather useless and idle in a sense. So, you know, why, why stay here as a moth of peace fluttering around uh, aimlessly when I could go off to war and, you know, go off and be part of my husband's experience and, and experience, experience a part of my husband that I, I haven't actually seen firsthand, which is, of course, Othello's uh, soldier, uh, soldiership and his warlike nature. She's not seen that part of him, but she's heard about it and she's fallen in love with that, so therefore she has a right to go. And she pleads at the end, uh, let me go with him. Um, interestingly, that I think it's interesting that she, she uses an imperative here as though she's almost dem you know, demanding the right to go with her husband, to travel with him to Cyprus. Uh, it, almost almost a, again, a, a transgression in the social boundaries there. Othello supports his wife. Let her have your voice. So he, he echoes his wife's words. He supports her. He supports her argument to come to Cyprus with him. But he's very cl clear uh, that he does not mean to say that he is uh, he's doing it to gratify his sexual urges. And he speaks in a kind of euphemistic way here, but he's very quick to point out that he's not merely uh, asking for his wife to be allowed to travel with him because of uh, his sexual feelings towards her. Uh, he claims to be too old for that. So here, when he speaks of the palate of my appetite, uh, that's a euphemism for his sexual appetite. Um, he says, I'm not asking her to come for that. I'm too old. So once again, we have the reference to an age gap, which is never really, we don't exactly know what the age gap is, but that's his excuse in a sense. He, he doesn't want to be seen, I suppose, uh, as being effeminate. Um, thinking about the ritual of going off to war. It is an incredibly hyper-masculine experience in the Elizabethan period uh, and I suppose Othello is concerned about how he might be perceived by his troops. Remember the general is supposed to be, you know, is, is, the, is the leader of the, tr of the troops. How would he be perceived by his troops if he were to be uh, going to battle with his wife by his side? Uh, he clearly worries that his soldiers and his men might mock him and goad him and uh, disrespect him because he might be perceived as being effeminate, as being womanly. And he's keen to make the point that just because he's travelling with a woman, it does not mean to say that he will uh, become womanly himself. And I think that's, he reiterates that point quite emphatically. What's interesting about Othello's argument here is that he seems, to, he uses words like defunct, uh, which describes his sexual prowess. So he's saying, actually, I'm not only am I far too old to, to have these strong, passionate sexual feelings, but my sexual desires are defunct, they are, they've died. So perhaps he is trying to make the point that he will not be distracted by Desdemona when he goes off to war, but he also might be, again, going way back to an earlier lesson, he might be rebuking uh, the, the racist uh, stereotype conjured by Iago and, uh, and Rodrigo that he is in, he's a lascivious, sexually potent uh, creature who's unable to control his sexual desires. And, that, and clearly this is a challenge to that because he's actually saying, well, I'm not, I'm, I'm my sexual, I'm, he's practically a eunuch. His sexuality is defunct. Um, and he echoes the words uh, of Desdemona in her speech by saying that, I've also, I fell in love with her bountiful and, and, and free mind, so he's, it's a kind of a, a platonic uh, love and marriage based on the fact that they're soulmates. And he then, again, just because I, I, I would argue he's worried about how he, how he will be perceived bringing his wife to war, he says, if ever I was blinded by Cupid's seal, if ever I was blinded by the arrows of love, uh, uh, and if ever that, in some ways... Um, distracted me from my from from the serious office of war that I've been charged with uh, conducting if ever it tainted my business as he puts it uh, let housewives make a skillet of my helm let housewives use my helmet as a kind of frying pan so he, he says he'll never essentially he's emphasizing the point I'll never be distracted I'll never uh, allow Desdemona's sexual advances to uh, lure me away from the 
importance of the battlefield and, and thinking about military matters. Um, and of course, if I were to, then it would essentially, he says, all of my adversaries would um, disgrace me and, and I'd ruin my reputation. I'm not going to go into much detail. In the, in the following lines, the Duke essentially says, uh, I don't mind if she stays or goes, but you need to know uh, as soon as possible. And, and a senator says you must away tonight, uh, which kind of accelerates the plot and drives the plot forward. Um, they then agree to meet at nine in the morning uh, when, they'll, when they'll set sail. And the Duke asks a fellow, who, who should we trust to uh, look after your commission? Um, what's interesting about Othello's argument here is that he seems to, he uses words like defunct, uh, which describes his sexual prowess. So he's saying, actually, I'm not only am I far too old to, to have these strong, passionate sexual feelings, but my sexual desires are defunct; they are they've died. So perhaps he is trying to make the point that he will not be distracted by Desdemona when he goes off to war, but he also might be, again, going way back to an earlier lesson, he might be rebuking uh, the, the racist uh, stereotype conjured by Iago and, uh, and Rodrigo, that he is in, he's a lascivious, sexually potent uh, creature who's unable to control his sexual desires. And, that, and clearly this is a challenge to that, because he's actually saying, well, I'm not, I'm, I'm my sexual, I'm, he's practically a eunuch, his sexuality is defunct. Um, and he echoes the words uh, of Desdemona in her speech by saying that I've also I fell in love with her bountiful and and, and free mind. So he's it's a kind of a, a platonic uh, love and marriage based on the fact that they're soulmates. And he then again just because I I, I would argue he's worried about how he how he will be perceived bringing his wife to war. He says if ever I was blinded by Cupid's seal, if ever I was blinded by the arrows of love, uh, at and if ever that, in some ways, um, distracted me from my from from the serious office of war that I've been charged with uh, conducting, if ever it tainted my business, as he puts it, uh, let housewives make a skillet of my helm. Let housewives use my helmet as a kind of frying pan. So he he says he'll never essentially he's emphasising the point. I'll never be distracted. I'll never uh, allow Desdemona's sexual advances to uh, lure me away from the importance of the battlefield and, and thinking about military matters um, and of course if I were to then it would essentially he says all of my adversaries would um, disgrace me and, and I'd ruin my reputation. I'm not going to go into much detail in the, in the following lines the Duke essentially says uh, I don't mind if she stays or goes but you need to know uh, as soon as possible and, and the, a senator says you must away tonight uh, which kind of accelerates the plot and drives the plot forward. Um, they then agree to meet at nine in the morning uh, when they'll when they'll set sail. And the Duke asks a fellow, "Who who shall we trust to uh, look after your commission?" Um, and there's a great moment of dramatic irony. I'll, I'll just put "di" for dramatic irony, as a fellow. Uh, responds to the Duke and says, well, I can trust my ensign, a man he is of honesty and trust. And of course, the ensign is Iago, and we hear this word <laughs> attached to Iago, who we'll focus on in a future lesson, time and time again, honest Iago, honest Iago, honest Iago. And of course, we know that he's, of course, the absolute opposite of that. We know that he is a duplicitous, two-faced, uh, scheming individual. Um, and it's really the tragic flaw, in a sense, of Othello that he can't see uh, Iago's true nature. He 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 misplaces his trust. Um, he hands his wife over to a, to his foe. They then depart, and the Duke, again trying to I, I suppose offer an olive branch to Brabantio, offers him another word of wisdom. He says, uh, "Your son is far more fair. So your son, your son-in-law is far more fair than black." And once again, we have this black and white imagery and this reiteration, which Again, we, so we, we heard in Desdemona's speech in which she said that, you know, I, I didn't fall in love with his visage, I fell in love with his mind, of blackness being ugly. Uh, and yet, uh, Othello is granted fairness because he, he has a beautiful uh, personality, he's, a be he's got beautiful a beautiful character. Uh, which is interesting, again, that the blackness of Othello is seen as an unfortunate uh, 
facade, an unfortunate outward show, as it were. Then we have the final lines that I want to focus on in this lesson, um, which is Brabantio speaking again in couplets, uh, which are used, I would say, to make, to, to make his point more emphatic. Uh, he instructs them more, look to her more, if thou hast eyes to see, she has deceived her father and made thee. And these words are a great, word, a great example of foreshadowing. Uh, they hang suspended over the rest of the play. Um, in a similar way, I, it reminds me a lot of the line from Mercutio, A Plague Upon Both Your Houses from Romeo and Juliet. Um, look to her, it's as though he doesn't trust his daughter. It's as though her, his daughter is someone who needs to be, who needs to be uh, kept an eye on, who needs to be closely observed, who is someone who is in a sense deceitful uh, and of course this is the seed that Iago will use later on to poison Othello this is, this is the root of what Iago will use to poison Othello he'll make the same claim that Desdemona is two-faced Desdemona is deceitful she is uh, un she's capable of being unfaithful and this seed will sprout and take form and become a monstrous thing later on in the play as it is something that Othello comes to believe in. Again he's addressed as a Moor and again I, it's interesting how poisoned the mind of Brabantio is by the events that took place in Act 1 Scene 2 where Rodrigo and uh, Iago sh disrupted his night's sleep and told him that his daughter was being uh, was, was, was having sex with Othello, the, the black ram as they put it. If thou hast eyes to see, this again, this kind of ominous claim that Othello is blinded by his love and his devotion for a deceitful creature. Uh, again, something that Yagi will later use to destabilize Othello. And then he comes to the crux of the issue. She has deceived her father. She's been disloyal. She's been disobedient. She's transgressed once she might transgress again. So she's transgressed against one of the most important social uh, conventions, which is the obedience to the father, uh, the patriarch, and she may well be. So there's that lingering threat that Desdemona is not to be trusted, that she's transgressed once, she's likely to transgress again and again. Of course, this is exactly the line that Iago will refer back to. She, he will say later in the play, in Act 3, she did deceive her father, and he'll, he'll remind Othello of the first transgression uh, of Desdemona, Desdemona's first transgression, of the fact that she is capable of being deceitful, she's capable of betrayal, she's capable of disobedience. So Iago will use this line against Othello later on in the most you know, fundamentally important way to poison Othello's mind and to... Po to twist and manipulate Othello into believing that his wife is unfaithful, which is of course what causes his jealousy, what causes his tragic downfall. That is the end of the lesson. I hope you found this lesson to be useful. I'll see you next time for another lesson on Act 1, Scene 3. Thank you very much for watching.